So, um, hello everybody. I'm very pleased to join you uh, in this, in our last plenary session of the World Congress. We will have here the honor to listen to um, uh, Alessandra, Professor Alessandra Fajan, uh, and uh, who, who is going to talk about human capital migration, innovation, and sustainability, some reflections on what we know and our future challenges. Uh, we also have the pleasure to have here with us Professor Daniela Constantin, who will be in charge of discussing Professor Fajan's presentation. Uh, let me introduce Professor Fajan. Uh, and after my introduction, I will give her um, the screen to give her keynote talk. And after she finishes, I will introduce a Professor Constantine so that she can prepare uh, uh, deliver her her what she prepared for discussing this keynote speech. And we also have time for questions from the audience. So you feel free to uh, write down your questions in the Q&A part of the platform. So uh, Alessandra Fajan is professor of applied economics, uh, director of social sciences and deputy director at the Gran Sasso Science Institute L'Aquila, Italy. She's also past president of the North American Regional Science Council, NARSC, current co-editor of Journal of Regional Science and previous editor of our journal Papers in Regional Science. Professor Fajan's research interests lie in the fields of regional and urban economics, demography, labor economics, and economics of education. Her publications cover a wide range of topics, including migration, human capital, labor markets, creativity, and local innovation and growth. She has co-authored over 80 academic publications. Her articles have appeared in journals such as Oxford, Oxford Economics Papers, Cambridge Journal of Economics, Feminist Economics, Regional Studies, Papers in Regional Science, Journal of Regional Science, and the Journal of Economic Geography, just to mention some of them. Professor Fajan is the 2007 recipient of the Most Modern Memorial Medal by the Regional Science Association International, Irish and British section, for the best paper published in the year 2006, and the 2015 recipient of the Geoffrey Hewins Award by the North American Regional Council for Outstanding Research Contribution by young scholar in the field of regional science. In a recent ranking of the top regional scientists in the world, done by Rickman and Winters in 2016, she was ranked 19th. Last but not least, she's the recipient of the 2020 edition of the Earth Surprise. It's a great honor to invite Professor Fajan to deliver her keynote lecture and please, Alessandra, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Eduardo. While I'm actually talking, I'm also loading my presentation. So you let me know if you can see it. You should see it, be able to see it in a second. Is it yes. on? Okay. Yes, yes. Right. Go ahead. Uh, so I know I have about 35 minutes, so I'll start my iPhone right now. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I have to admit that I was a little bit disappointed not being able to come to Marrakesh. I was already looking at the hotel and it would have been my first time in Morocco in, in North Africa. So I was really looking forward to, to being there, but I'm sure that there will be other opportunities in the future and I'm honored anyway to, to be here even virtually with you today. All right, Eduardo. So uh, as you said, I've done work on human capital migration for quite a while now. And yet in the past uh, four or five years, uh, I haven't done very many keynote talk on this topic 
because since I came back to Italy, I devoted myself more to peripheral areas. And so a lot of my keynotes recently have been on that topic or even on the topic of immigrants, but international immigrants and their role in this peripheral area, rather than my first love, which was actually a human capital migration. So when I got asked to uh, give this uh, talk, I decided to do something new. So this is an experiment. Let's see how it, it comes out because it's the first time I actually delivered this uh, uh, keynote. Uh, and I kind of stopped and I looked back at what I've done in the past few years. I'll tell you in a second how many years. Um, and uh, and I, I kept on working on this topic, basically. Uh, it's not like because I was doing something else, I didn't uh, continue with my, say, first love. And so I just wanted to show you how my thinking kind of uh, uh, developed in these years. And... Uh, how I'm planning to keep on going and what we are planning to do at the Grand Sasso Science Institute. And of course, you know, I'm looking forward to your comments and maybe suggest your new ideas on how to uh, progress on the topic. Okay, so the title, you have read it now because I've been talking for about two minutes now. Uh, okay, so uh, I divided my presentation into kind of three uh, historical period of my life, the past, the present, and the future. And although I'm not quite as old as the dinosaurs, I kind of felt a little bit like that when I started preparing this presentation because I looked back at when I actually started working on the topic of human capital and migration, and I realized it was 20 years ago and that was my face when I realized it was actually over 10 years because that I felt like it was more or less a decade it was actually double that so I kind of you know felt a lot older than what I thought I was and uh, the I was very lucky back then um, to uh, have the opportunity to work of course with Professor Phil McCann who was my advisor and we had this uh, kind of new for that time, micro data on uh, students and graduates in the UK. So I had thousands and thousands of observations uh, on uh, uh, individuals. Uh, and I remember, you know, uh, it, it, maybe you don't remember how long ago is 20 years ago, but my computer couldn't handle the amount of data I had. And so I had to take coffee breaks while the programs were running with this data. But that was uh, my, my luck actually, because having this kind of, uh, uh, micro data at the time was, was really, really uh, something quite advanced. And so initially, with this micro data, we started looking at the issue of uh, graduate and students, so human capital migration. And initially, I was particularly interested in two uh, main topics that then I kind of always come back in every review that I read uh, since then. Uh, on one side, we were looking at the migration determinants, and on the other, we were also starting thinking about the migration consequences on the regional economies of these, you know, um, highly uh, educated individuals. So I started uh, back then my PhD and then later on my lectureship looking at the migration determinants. And uh, I was looking at both individual characteristics. So I was very much into asking myself, who are the most mobile graduates and students? Who are the most mobile individuals? Uh, I was looking at gender aid, education and so on, but also I was looking at where they were going. And so I was also looking at the regional characteristics. I'll just try to kind of summarize a little bit uh, some of the papers that I had. Of course, I classified them according to their uh, migration behavior. Since I had three location points where they were living before studying, where they were studying, and where they were going to work first, I could classify them according to their sequential migration paths. And I had repeat migrants, return migrants, university stayer, late migrants, and non-migrants. And so at the very beginning, I started looking at who were these categories. And one of the uh, findings that then uh, got published in the Journal of Regional Science was this gender split between the different categories of migrants with the female very being very much at the extreme 
uh, of, um, having a very dichotomous behavior, either being non-migrants at all or being repeat migrants when they were moving and the male being in between, but also other uh, interesting patterns uh, um, were coming out, like for instance, regional patterns, Wales and Scotland were behaving differently than England, social sciences were behaving differently than creative or than the students in arts or in natural sciences, and so on. Return migrants seem to be low achievers at the university, so the return migration in our case seemed to be more of a corrective movement and so on. Uh, and then we also looked uh, in, in different papers at the kind of the attraction of London, the London pool. Now I was trying to summarize this using this map that came out in, in this uh, paper in, uh, in 2013. Basically the colors gives you the average direction of the movement of all the people that were studying in that location. And as you can tell, all the colors point towards London. So much so that when we were looking at the migration behavior of students and graduates, we had to kind of take out London and treat London as a, a different case than the rest of the country. Uh, then, as I said, uh, having done a few work uh, on the uh, few contribution on the uh, determinants of, of this human capital migration, I started looking also at the consequences of human capital migration. And in particular, I was interested both at the consequences on the individuals. So were they having a higher salary, more job satisfaction because they were moving and they were very mobile, but also on uh, the innovation of the regions. And here there was a paper that came out uh, in 2014 with an ex-PhD student of mine, but now she's a reader at the University of uh, Reading. And we were looking at how the different migration behavior were affecting their salaries. So running a, a straight uh, means equation first and then doing some matching, we found Found out that more or less uh, uh, repeat migrants had a, an increase in their salaries that was between 10 to 15 percent thanks to their higher migration propensity. Um, so that was actually a, a good thing. But we also found out that the return migrants uh, were actually worse off than the people that were not migrating at all, which was kind of confirming this idea that the return migration was a corrective movement after studying at the university, but not being as successful. Um, we also looked at job satisfaction, especially for these return migrants in the creative uh, arts, because one of the criticisms that we got was that uh, these creative arts graduates were coming back home and they were return uh, migrants, didn't care so much about the salary, they had a different value system, so they were really looking about being happy rather than being rich. Um, but we had a data set which was more longitudinal. They were looking at these uh, students three and a half years post-graduation. And they were also asking them about the job satisfaction rather than just salaries. And what we found out in this paper, following up on previous comments on the previous contributions was actually they were not very satisfied with their jobs either. So then we open up a kind of field on these creative bohemian graduates. We kind of uh, found an oxymoron to define them. Um, and, and we found out that in fact, there are issues with particularly these kind of graduates and the, the kind of career uh, trajectory. Another thing that I looked uh, at uh, uh, as a consequence was not so much on the individual, but on the regional economy. And in particular, uh, Phil and I, Phil McCann and, and myself, were interested in uh, the effect of human capital on innovation. Back then, and I'll tell you why I'm saying back then, <laughs> the only data we had was on patent. We all know about the limitations of patents. We even clearly state the limitations in the paper in 2009, um, but that's what we had at the time. And so we actually found out uh, that there was a kind of uh, cumulative causation kind of mechanism between innovation and the presence of these very highly educated uh, uh, young individuals at a regional level. However, and this was kind of a controversial, a bit of a controversial results back then, we found out that the real role of the university was not so much in spin-off startups, uh, you know, uh, producing patents. That was an effect, but it was not of a magnitude that probably could really make a difference in the region. Uh, but the, the most important role was actually in being a conduit 
of attracting this human capital from outside. So the idea is always, you know, you attract these young people from the outside or you retain these young people in your regions. And then if you manage to embed them in the local economy, this is where really a university can have a positive effect on the economy and the innovation of a region. Okay, the present. So, uh, I haven't stopped working on the topic of human capital migration. And back in, in my mind, uh, so in the back of my mind, there were all these limitations of things that I had not addressed over the years, uh, but that were possible maybe to address or at least advance because of uh, the new data that were becoming available or new tools that uh, I'm, I'm probably gonna talk to you uh, uh, when I'm talking about the future. And so um, one of the things that was really bothering me was this issue of how to measure innovation. Um, I had a talk with several people that actually do economics of innovation and are more specialized than me on the topic. And um, when we were talking about, for instance, peripheral areas, uh, the, the, the current thought is that, well, there isn't much innovation in peripheral areas. Uh, but part of that is also that if we measure innovation just with patents, it's obvious that we will never catch innovation in these areas which are kind of less densely populated or where innovation maybe is not measured or cannot be measured in the traditional form of patents. Um, and so it, one way of solving this problem is actually to go and collect data by asking them and you have all this community innovation survey now that kind of do that and they ask a question to them another is go and do your own survey which we'll probably do at some point but there are also secondary data that are available that are starting measuring innovation not just with patents but also with other form of intellectual property rights uh, such as trademark or design rights. Now, the expert really on this topic is Carolina Castaldi, who works in Utrecht. And so together with a postdoc uh, researcher at the GSSI, uh, Adri uh, Adriana Pinate, and another colleague from a university uh, here in, in the Abruzzo region in Chieti, uh, we decided to work with her and see whether we could find a different uh, effect of the human capital migration if we were actually using, instead of patents, uh, also trademarks and design rights as a proxy for innovation. In fact, in 2017, uh, I published a, a review together with my two PhD students of mine uh, back at OSU, in which actually one of the, our claim was that uh, the highly skilled migrants ended up working more in advanced service sectors uh, rather than uh, manufacturing sectors and the patents uh, in these sectors are actually heavily underestimating innovation. So following from this intuition, we wanted to see whether you know, there was something different when we were expanding our measures of innovation. Uh, I, because now I'm working in Italy, I moved from looking at the UK to actually looking at the uh, geographical context where I'm now, which is Italy. And uh, um, this is actually the growth of uh, um, intellectual property rights, including patents, trademark, and design rights between 2003 to 2020. And 12. And the four uh, different bars that you see are actually the macro regions of Italy, Northeast, Northwest, Center, and South. Now, I'm pretty much sure that all of you know that there is a, a north-south divide in Italy, with the north being more industrialized and uh, more developed, and the south especially having uh, more problems, uh, being more of a lagging regions compared to the rest of, of the country. But what was interesting was that just by looking at this data, the South was actually uh, having an increase in other forms of patents, which was stronger than the traditional uh, rich part of the country. So following up on this, we actually collected all sorts of data that we could find on uh, internal uh, migration in Italy. And we looked at both international and interregional uh, migration. And we divided these uh, uh, migration, as I did in the past, by uh, 
human capital, so by level of education, pretty much. Um, so we divided high human capital, so people that had a degree, with medium law, people that didn't have a degree, so intermediate to low skills. Uh, and as you can see, uh, as probably you would expect, we have a kind of uh, uh, migration flows of the uh, say high skilled, more towards the north, but also the, the center, the medium low skilled were actually more located in the uh, less rich uh, regions. And that was for, sorry, international migration, especially because uh, actually they do come, most of them in the south, uh, that's where they, they are welcomed. And then there is a kind of filtering process towards north. Uh, for interregional migration, uh, the differences are not as marked as for international migrants, the, the path is completely different, and, but you can still uh, tell that there are a lot more highly skilled that move towards the north. Anyway, to cut the long story short, because uh, I have a lot of things to show you and I'm already at 17 minutes. Uh, looking at innovation at industry level, so the level I showed you before, the provinces, and at the share of immigrants by educational attainment, and comparing our results with the current literature, there were a few contributions here, I'm just mentioning some of them that were looking at these in other contexts. We actually found that, uh, uh, the, first of all, there was a significant difference between high skill migration and medium low skill migration. But also, there were differences in terms of international versus interregional migration. And especially we found that trademarks were positively affected in a significant way, but both interregional and international high skill migration, while the design rights were increasing mostly due to international high skill migration and patents, which are in more traditional sectors that belong more to kind of our history, right? You can think about uh, all sorts of manufacturing in Italy from clothing to leather to furniture and so on. These were actually still linked to the migration which was interregional, so of Italians within Italy rather than people that were coming from outside. Um, so this, this is where we are at the moment, that's why I put it on the now, uh, the, what we are currently working on, and, and now we are looking into um, more uh, details uh, of these results that we found. Another thing that we just now started working on, and this is with uh, still Adriana, who, by the way, is not Italian, but she's from uh, South America, so... <laughs> Yes, um, and, and with Martina Dalmulin, who is another um, researcher at the GSSI, um, we started being, so I, I started uh, looking into also green innovation and artificial intelligence recently with some colleagues of mine that do economics of innovation. And now there is a lot of talk about sustainability. So here we have the sustainable transition, the green transition and so on. Um, and in 2011, these two people, Schlaus and Jacobs, uh, published actually a paper who is called uh, Human Capital and Sustainability. So 10 years ago, they were among the, the, the first that actually mentioned that in, in a title of a published paper. Uh, and so we started uh, thinking about uh, whether uh, there could be a relationship between so-called sustainable green activities and the presence of these educated young people. So in other words, uh, if we're actually now looking at the environmentally sustainable economic activities and their geographical spread, do they need uh, these young people with high human capital? Do they go together? Is there an effect on that? Of course, one of the most difficult thing was actually finding a taxonomy of environmentally sustainable economic activities but luckily enough, there was uh, uh, the European Commission in 2020, so last year, published uh, a taxonomy of green sustainable activities. So we have this uh, four digit code that identify what according to the EU um, are activities that, that are necessary to implement the so-called European Green Deal. So what Adriana did very patiently <laughs> was to put together these maps where she actually looked at these four digit industrial activities and she looked at whether these activities were growing or were decreasing in time in Italy. 
And the growth was especially in the so-called sustainable service activities more than sustainable manufacturing activities, at least in Italy. So this gives you an idea of, of what we found. Uh, right, uh, again, I don't have time to, to show you the, the whole paper, but basically, okay, so we did an OLS, we also uh, did two IV models uh, using two different instruments, one was coming from card, the other one was coming from another paper, uh, so we, we did uh, try to correct at least for uh, endogeneity as well, uh, but what we found basically in the initial OLS model was that a 1% increase in the share of high skilled internal migrants was associated with the 6.2% increase in the employment growth of sustainable activities. Um, while a 1% increase in the share of low skilled migrants was actually negatively associated with the growth of these sustainable activities, as if there was in fact a, a selection process, uh, the a role of new knowledge in fostering these, in a sense, uh, new activities or green activities. Uh, so then we divide uh, manufacturing and services uh, and we control for endogeneity and the signs and the significance stayed the same, although of course the magnitude was slightly uh, different uh, once we split and we control for endogeneity. But it's, it was interesting that actually once we control for a lot of other different factors, we did find again a relationship uh, with human capital migration sorry, between human capital migration and this kind of green activities, which are so crucial now with the, the uh, green transition being advertised in, in Europe. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, all of you know that, but of course now, uh, not only Italy, but most of the countries in the European Union are getting quite a, a large amount of money um, that they have to invest in kind of national resilience and recovery plans. And two of the key words in these uh, plans for the future are actually the digital transition and the sustainable transition, the green transition. So that's why uh, looking into these uh, activities has also a, a policy relevance in the post COVID uh, period. And that's why we started looking into that. So I'm working on these two. Uh, there are also other things that I'm doing, but I thought these were probably the two uh, key ones that I wanted to show you today, knowing that, of course, I only have uh, uh, about half, half an hour, 35 minutes. Uh, okay, so, and now what about the future? Okay, so um, one, I, I actually think, I'm, I, as a person, I try to be very optimistic. So I think the future looks bright. Uh, and I think so, because actually, uh, as I said, uh, one of the reasons why I was so lucky at the beginning of my career was that instead of having aggregate data, I had this very detailed micro data that allowed me to look at a phenomenon very, in a very detailed way, in a sense. And though I was struggling back then uh, with kind of, you know, uh, tools to handle this amount, large amount of data, um, that was really super interesting for me as a young person. Uh, and now I'm getting kind of excited, like a lot of other people are in this uh, period, in this historical uh, period, by the fact that uh, we now can go from micro data to what has been called big data. And so uh, in this particular paper that uh, I've done with three colleagues of mine and the Grand Sasso Science Institute, Andrea Scani, Sandro Montessori and Alessandro Palma, uh, although we don't have the, the human capital content of migrants in, 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 this, uh, in this data, we did make use of big data that came from Facebook. And we were looking at something a little bit different. We were looking at uh, the effect of uh, uh, mobility within and between uh, local labor markets in Italy. Um, and we were looking at the before and after the lockdowns. So I'm sure 
you all know, but in Italy, we got hit by COVID and we went into lockdown. So people basically couldn't move, but uh, still they could move for necessity reasons or for work reasons, especially if they were in what we call essential services, uh, uh, essential uh, sectors, right? So for that reason, uh, with, with the documents uh, that they had to fill in, they could still move. And so we were interested in looking at the mobility uh, before and after the lockdown in Italy, how that changed and also uh, that linked to the uh, spread of COVID and so on. Uh, but what I found fascinating was that uh, Facebook uh, uh, gave accessibility, well, we, we had to, you know, have a request and then uh, ask, explicitly say why we were using this data and so on, it was for researches and whatever, but uh, given all these, uh, uh, Facebook gave us data uh, that were extremely detailed. So we had data that were very frequent. We had three observation per day of the mobility patterns of people. And we had a very large sample because basically it was all the Facebook users, which you can imagine there are millions, right? Um, so I was very excited because we had all this data. The people that had to actually handle this data, which in this case were Andrea and, and Alessandro, were a little bit less excited because handling this data <laughs> required a lot of patience, a lot of skills. Uh, and you know, you really need to, to know how to, to do that. But to cut the long story short, uh, we realized the potential of big data. So this big data really can, can be the next step towards studying a lot of phenomena. But having said that, uh, with big potential, uh, even though I'm an optimistic person, come also possible problems. Uh, so it is very easy and we realized that uh, quite quickly. And that's why there is four of us. We were actually trying to, to make sense and use this data in a kind of uh, uh, logical way. It is very easy when you have such a mass of data to get completely lost or to start doing research, which is basically data driven and not theory driven. You also have this uh, risk when you use micro data, but the, the more you, you get data, the more you can actually run the risk of not thinking at all. What is my intuition of the world? What am I trying to prove here? And let the data drive <laughs> your research. So it's, it, this is very, it's a big risk, especially, I believe, for younger people that might think this is a good idea, but I don't think it is. You also need appropriate tools of analysis, appropriate models, because when you have such large data, you need, well, appropriate hardware, but also appropriate software, but also appropriate models to handle this data. And that is also not, uh, not, not so straightforward. You need to think carefully of what you're doing. And then, of course, uh, uh, you have all this amount of data, but there are well, there are also very famous uh, uh, legal cases uh, in the last few years that kind of substantiate my point. There are big issues of privacy and anonymity. So, for instance, it was very good to have all this amount of data, but if we were to uh, go back to the idea of dividing these uh, flows, uh, these movements uh, by education, we wouldn't be able to do that because having the individual characteristics of this big data, it's always uh, a big issue. It's not impossible. They can be, of course, anonymized and whatever. But when you are trying to get more detail, so it's basically a lot of quantity. But when you go down to the quality of the data, so to what you get for each of these observations, then it's when the, the problems start to hit you because it's very difficult to get a lot of detail on this uh, on this data, obviously because of uh, uh, privacy and anonymity issues. Another thing that we are actually working on at the GSSI, this is something that we have been talking for about uh, three years now, pretty much. Um, so instead of just using secondary data, it is also possible to collect your own primary data. 
the best way would be to actually combine large scale secondary data with the more detailed primary data. Normally you don't do that because primary data take time and money to be collected. Um, but we are actually trying to, to go over this issue uh, and start collecting primary data. We have done some work um, with uh, some uh, questionnaire and kind of experimental behavioral tools. Um, what we're really interested in right now is to combine economics with psychology and especially with the issue of COVID, I got really into this idea of trying to really understand how the preferences and decision-making processes of, individ of individuals might have been changed by the experience of the pandemic. This is one issue. The other is also taking into account in general, even if there, was, there wasn't any pandemic, uh, when we are looking at these uh, secondary data and we don't actually look into more kind of uh, behavioral uh, tools, we almost never account for the biases that individuals have in the decision-making process. And this is where actually uh, kind of experimental tool or neurosciences uh, can help us. Um, and so what we are looking at right now, it's, uh, we are buying basically, we are creating a small lab in which we are buying these uh, tools that are uh, normally used in the neurosciences, such as the eye tracking or the face reading or the mouse tracking, uh, to look into the decision making process of individuals. And once you study these, you can apply these to different types of individuals. So you can have. Um, have some people that have migrated in the past and people that did never migrate, ask them the same question. And just as an example, right, you can track their mouse and see how decided they are in answering because you can track the path of the mouse that they're using, or you can track their eyes while they're answering or their facial expression or whatever. Um, I'm also very interested in gender issues, as you probably know. So uh, I'm also planning to look into the uh, difference uh, uh, between uh, female and, and male migrants or individuals when they actually decide to do something or answer uh, a, a question. And this goes back to the original uh, paper uh, that I showed you right at the beginning, where I actually found that the behavior of uh, female versus male migrants uh, was different because female tended to be more dichotomous in their decision process. Uh, but I don't know why, and, and I, I don't know if there is a psychological or a behavioral difference, which I would like to explore, maybe with these new neuroscience tools. 33 minutes, two minutes, but I'm almost at the end. Uh, okay, so I have this and then the conclusion, so I think I'm right on time. Um, in reality, there are also secondary data that look at kind of the uh, uh, person personality traits of migrants already, right? These are self-reported though. And so in 2021, I published a paper with an ex-PhD student of mine uh, in the US, and now he's, uh, he's finished a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, what was interesting in these uh, uh, data sets is that they were collecting uh, the big five personality traits of these individuals that were in the data set. So we knew whether they were migrants or not. And we also knew their own self-reported score for the uh, five personality traits, which uh, uh, are extraversion, agreeableness, consciousness, emotional stabilities, and openness to new experiences. And we found, in fact, that migrants exhibit certain characteristics more than others. However, these were self-reported traits, right? And so it would be interesting to actually have more objective tools uh, to see whether what they self-report is also true when you are trying to kind of pass me this term, read their mind. Um, of course, this has some kind of policy relevance because if you find out, like we kind of found, that uh, uh, migrants are the people that are, in a sense, less averse to risk, this could also connect to other um, phenomena, economic phenomena, such as, for instance, entrepreneurship and or being prone to innovate. So, you know, opens up a lot of different possible applications here. So to conclude, 
Uh, I know I, I went very fast on a lot of different topics, but this was kind of the idea to give you kind of a, an overview of, of the, the, the thinking on this topic that I had from the very beginning to kind of what I'm planning to do in the future. Uh, I think that the future looks bright in the sense that uh, we are observing new data, new tools, uh, that are now at our disposal. Of course, you need to uh, train yourself uh, on how to use them properly. But it's very important as economists to deepen our understanding of human behavior. One thing that I always say to my friends and colleagues who are physicists, because sometimes I, I have the feeling that they don't understand this, is that we are not dealing with atoms. We are dealing with human beings. So making forecasts, prediction, uh, trying to understand the phenomenon when you are dealing with human beings is a lot more difficult than when you are dealing with something that is a, a little bit more stable, right? Uh, and so if we understand the behavior of uh, the human beings, we can then also understand, sorry, I just had to stop my WhatsApp because somebody was keeping on sending me messages. Okay, um, so uh, the, in, if we understand better the human behavior, we can understand a lot of phenomena, even economic phenomena, a lot better. Um, and personally, the more I study the phenomenon of migration, the more questions I have. So I might be able to find out a partial question to some intuition I have, but then I don't know why. And so another question opens up. And so I really believe in this sentence that I put at the end, that knowledge has a beginning, but no end. And in fact, the, the more you know, the more you know that you don't know, in a sense. And so I think that there's still lots of work to be done, but we are getting closer and closer to understanding this phenomenon better. And Thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandra, for this really very stimulating talk. I think we'll have a lot to discuss, but I will invite first Professor Daniela Constantin to discuss your, to, 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 to initiate the discussion of your talk. I will introduce Professor Constantin She's professor of regional economics and policy at the Bucharest University of Economic Studies and director of the Research Center for Macroeconomic and Regional Forecasting at the same university. She's the president of the Romanian Regional Science Association, member of the Council of the European Regional Science Association and counselor at large of the Council of the Regional Science Association International. Professor Constantin carried out several research states abroad as Fulbright Senior Scholar, two grants at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in, in 1998, when I met her, and at George Mason University in 2014-2015. The AAD, the German Ex Academic Exchange Service, five states starting from 93 at the University of Karlsruhe, Freiburg, and Heidelberg, Tempus Scholar at the University of Reading, UK, and at the Free University of Amsterdam. Scholar of the Romanian Academy at the Vienna University of Economics, among others. She has coordinated important national and international research projects financed by Horizon 2020, Framework Program 7, ESPON, GDN, uh, among others. And in 2020, she was elected as a member of the Academia Europea. Her main scientific interests are in regional policy analysis, regional conversion, convergence and competitiveness, uh, EU structural assistance, regional and city resilience, resilience, regional clusters, migration, and other interests. Professor Constantine, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for all your help and collaboration, not only for the association, but specifically for uh, this uh, World Congress. Thank you very much, and the screen's yours. Thank you, Eduardo, and uh, hello, everyone. 
Greetings from the warm and sunny Bucharest. Uh, the background image of my screen is a picture recently taken by myself of the main building of my university with a beautiful apple tree in full blossom as a nature's message that uh, despite the pandemic, despite everything, la vita e bella, and it offers us countless reasons of joy, like now the joy of being together for such an amazing Congress. So congratulations and many thanks uh, to the organizers and congratulations to you, Alessandra, for your excellent presentation. Excellent uh, for uh, the high quality of the scientific content, but uh, also very important for the enthusiasm and emotion. I noticed you invest in your uh, research and in exposing the results that is conducive to uh, very empire, uh, inspired explanations, uh, connections between the issues addressed today between human capital migration, innovation and uh, sustainability in a, let's say, evolutive perspective that uh, has brought together valuable ideas from your past and present research and uh, reflections about future inquiries. If I had to choose just one highlight for each of these uh, three parts, uh, they uh, would be for the past, the emphasis on the individual migration behavior, for the present, the very interesting connection between human uh, capital uh, migration and uh, sustainability, green activities, a very uh, timely topic, and for the future, the opportunities, but also the challenges entailed by the use of big data in uh, human uh, capital migration studies, as well as uh, the new avenues uh, that can be opened by the use of behavioral and uh, experimental tools. But now, let me step uh, into your uh, paper uh, universe and um, uh, proposing a complementary perspective and some uh, related additional comments because uh, I fully agree with you that the more we discuss about uh, migration, the more additional questions uh, come up. This uh, complementary perspective uh, refers to seeing uh, human capital migration through the lens of uh, uh, resilience. You have mentioned uh, resilience in um, uh, the context of the national uh, plans for recovery and um, uh, resilience. Uh, here I'm uh, going to, to refer to, to the social uh, economic uh, component uh, relating to human capital migration. It's true, sustainability itself has a social economic component, but despite the, ho uh, despite, uh, the hot debates about uh, overlapping trade-offs between uh, sustainability and resilience, I'm, uh, however, on the side of those who consider them distinctive approaches, of course, with the um, uh, objective uh, complementarities. Thus, uh, resilience addresses the adaptive, uh, responsive capacity able to maintain system dynamics, whereas sustainability is seen as an approach envisioning the future, which focuses on intervention aiming to uh, reach desirable outcomes. From uh, the wide uh, range of uh, human capital migration related uh, issues that can be addressed through the lens of resilience, I will bring into discussion just two examples inspired by your uh, thoughtful statement about the consequences of human capital migration on migrants and places. With, with uh, regard uh, to uh, individuals, with regard to uh, migrants, you referred to salary and uh, satisfaction. I would explicitly add integration and inclusion because the highly skilled subject to interregional and even more to international migration display a wide diversity in terms of uh, nationality, ethnicity, race, age, uh, etc., which require clear responses from the whole society in terms of uh, adaptive mechanisms uh, able to uh, take into consideration social capital, uh, social community cohesion, social interactions, uh, social networks, uh, cultural diversity, and so on and so forth. In other words, um, innovative uh, integration and uh, social inclusion uh, solutions are long-term investments in a strong and more resilient uh, society. Now, with uh, regard to uh, places, I would address an issue from an opposite uh, perspective described uh, in detail by Richard Florida in his book, uh, The New Urban Crisis. He demonstrates that the same forces that powered the growth of the world's most successful cities, the creative class newcomers included, 
have generated vexing challenges such as uh, gentrification, unaffordability, segregation, inequality, a phenomenon extensively discussed by uh, Edward Glaser in his uh, keynote speech on uh, Tuesday as well. In terms of uh, adaptive, uh, adaptive uh, mechanisms and uh, responses, we uh, also had a very thoughtful presentation on Monday at uh, the Regional Science Academy session delivered by uh, Stephen Craig and uh, Janet uh, Colhays, addressing uh, uh, public expenditure impact on uh, urban uh, population uh, growth, uh, actually a chapter in the recent book on urban empires uh, edited by Edward Glaser, Karima Kurtit and uh, uh, Peter uh, Nykam. In brief, uh, based uh, on the analysis of uh, expenditure uh, detail, Craig and uh, Cole Hayes pointed out uh, that in the state of Texas, higher taxes are somehow unexpected attractive for migrants, but repelling for residents and therefore special programs uh, aiming to, to attract uh, residents and firms are uh, financed by uh, public uh, uh, expenditures um, uh, as well. Um, well, now, uh, um, uh, even if I uh, feel that uh, I have just uh, started talking, uh, I, I know that uh, I have to, to finish uh, soon. So uh, just to uh, just want to, to add that uh, big data and the behavioral uh, approaches that you, Alessandra, mentioned uh, in um, uh, the final part of uh, your presentation can also contribute to finding appropriate responses uh, to this uh, question. And uh, if you still allow uh, me, I would uh, would uh, like uh, just to, to end in a quite funny note, saying that uh, in my whole uh, discussion, with just one exception, I used uh, human capital, not creative class term. However, uh, in a recent book, I enjoyed very much uh, reading The Wealth and Poverty of Cities, Why Nations uh, Matter by Mario Poles. He says that the prefix uh, creative is pleasing to the ear, less mercenary than uh, human capital, which surely helps uh, explain the success of uh, creative uh, class. So may I ask you, uh, Alessandra, what is your uh, opinion about the mercenary meeting, uh, meaning of uh, human uh, capital? Anyway, the journey continues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniela. Please, Alessandra, you wanna. And, I, and those of you that are uh, listening to this uh, talk, please feel free to uh, put questions on the Q&A. I'll be very quick. So I start from the last one, the mercenary concept of human capital. I guess you are right, because originally, when you look at the work by Gary Becker, he explicitly talked about human capital as something that has an economic value. Uh, and uh, he talks about education and on the job training. Then on the job training has been kind of forgotten over the years because we didn't have data. So in education became the only way uh, of measuring it. And I've done some work on creative class and creative capital myself as well, in which we were trying to actually uh, compare uh, the two. If you ask me, I think that human capital has a much larger meaning than just uh, using it for uh, money or for an economic value kind of thing. So uh, in my mind, when I talk about human capital, if it's possible, I would like to have all the dimension of uh, the, the human being, the, the ability of human being inside, which includes entrepreneurial spirits, which include creativity, which includes education. And I think that uh, um, it, Yes, if you stick back to the original concept in which basically you just look at how productive a, a, humans are, that it's very restrictive and you use the right term, it's quite mercenary. But this is not what I have in mind, even though I'm approximating it with education, I'm also thinking about creativity and entrepreneurial spirits of people as part of their human capital. Um, and okay, so on the consequences, oh, okay, on resilience, uh, uh, you you talk to somebody that uh, it's already you preach to the converted, they say in English, because I've done work on the resilience, and so. It, it, you are absolutely right uh, that uh, there is uh, this component that needs to be taken into account. In terms of the individuals, again, I've done some work on integration, but of interregional migrants, uh, independent of their uh, human capital level. But again, I'm very sensitive to this uh, uh, issue that you brought up, because it's absolutely true that aside from 
again, labor market outcomes, uh, human capital is important for uh, uh, social inclusions, for integration, and in fact, uh, cultural diversity is also uh, a, a key to this. Uh, so yes, uh, I've never actually linked the kind of graduates human capital migration to these uh, uh, phenomena, uh, but it would be interesting to look at it. We were looking at, for instance, the voting patterns and uh, education and cultural diversity. We were looking at uh, the geography of hatred and uh, integration and social inclusions. We kind of never linked that with migration. Uh, with, with the human capital migration. Uh, as for the last thing that you mentioned, so uh, if I understand it correctly, you were talking about uh, kind of negative consequences of having uh, a high inflow of educated, highly educated people into a region. Um, yes, there are. I still believe that if you kind of uh, balance the plus and minuses, there are more benefits to large cities, for instance, uh, than actually the, the negative externalities uh, uh, that can come from these or the increasing prices you mentioned on affordability. Um, however, this is what your comment made me think about. The COVID pandemic kind of changed a little bit the preferences of young, bright, uh, you know, educated people in Italy. And we are observing more and more people that young people that are actually rethinking their way of living, the role of agglomeration. And we now have sporadic, but still there are cases of uh, high human capital migration going back to peripheral areas. And so this is what we are monitoring right now, because maybe the pandemic is partially, maybe in a very tiny, small part, solving that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. So as I said, the journey continues. Maybe we'll yeah. keep in touch for, for more <laughs> exchanges of ideas. Thank you so much. Well, I, I have a couple of brief questions, if I may. Well, um, your trajectory is very interesting. You mentioned that in the beginning of your career, you had the, I would say, the, the luck of having access to this amazing microdata, right? And that gave you, let's say, a first mover advantage, if I may say so. But what's important is that you had to work with structural data, structured microdata that was ba based on theory when you put this data together. And when you see your research throughout these years, we saw that's heavily based on sound uh, theoretical grounds, right? And now, uh, so, so you learn uh, by training to be critical about data. And you see, you, you mentioned right when you're talking about, when you discuss innovation, you're talking about, you, you have issues about concerns about measurement that's in your work, right? And now you see a movement towards non-structured data. You mentioned, yeah, we are, the future is bright because if I may quote you, the, the, we have new data and tools that are, at, that are out at our disposal. Yesterday, we had a very inspiring uh, keynote by Professor Isabel Thomas, and she was uh, emphatic in mentioning, let's not the data speak by themselves. So uh, I want to, to, to listen from you, what, what, what extra caution young researchers should have that you did not face, but moving from structured data to big data, you see may put a danger for, for young researchers in, in regional science. So what you said, uh, the, the kind of having research that is theory based, I think that the first step is always to read a lot. I remember, I mean, uh, I wish Phil was here because I'm talking about him, but Phil, the first time I entered Phil McCann's office, I remember he gave me a pile of articles and he said, okay, start reading. And that's what I did. And so the first thing is always to kind of have a solid background in what we already know about something, what kind of theories are over there. And then 
some people call that having a hypothesis, but uh, again, quoting what Phil told me at the very beginning of my career, he always told me, what's your intuition of the world? What's your, I mean, it's a theory, but at the end is an intuition, right? So you have to have an intuition, a kind of call it gut feeling or whatever it is. After you read all this amount of work, you might have an idea that is worth testing that has some kind of explanation in the back of your mind, uh, which, you know, it's, it's a kind of theoretical uh, uh, thing. Uh, and then you go and you look at whether the data can help you finding some kind of evidence to what you have in your mind after you have seen what everybody else has already done on the topic. Uh, I have a little bit of a fear that this amount of, uh, as you said, unstructured, random uh, big data might detract the attention of young researchers from thinking first. So you don't just run uh, uh descriptive and then you say oh look these two are correlated they could be correlated for all sorts of reasons right there were maps a few years ago that were correlating the brexit vote with the mad cow disease but the omitted variable was of the rural regions right so you can't let the data speak without you thinking <laughs> first and so this is the other thing is of course the micro data i had was a survey that, as you said, was structured for a certain purpose, which was looking at students and graduates. When you're looking at Facebook data, they are absolutely completely random and yet biased in the sense that even when we were using this Facebook data, there was there is all this uh, debate now on younger people leaving Facebook and then the data you get are only for certain generations of people. You have to be very well aware of the limitations. If you're not aware of the limitations, uh, then your research has very little validity. Thank you. Let me see if we have uh, any question. We are reaching the time, but uh, we have in this. The, one thing interesting about interesting about this congress is that we have a floating audience, right? Because today I started at five a.m. Brazilian time, uh, talking to colleagues in New Zealand. That was eight p.m. And what we are verifying here is that we have a move uh, a floating audience. So. People will have access to this to this uh, uh, um, uh, keynote lecture. It's going to be on, on our web page, and I think I, I would you you already gave specific advice for younger scholars on dealing with um, big data. Uh, but you, I mean, I, I you 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 I have to say you're your source of inspiration for many regional scientists, and. The last request I'd like to, to ask you, uh, Alessandra, is that if, if, you, if you have to give an, one, one single advice for young scholars that want to pursue a career in regional science, what would you tell them? OK, so. Again, this is something that uh, I've been told in the past. Uh, you have to think more about the idea rather than about the technicality. So uh, especially when I was in the US, uh, I had a lot of PhD students who were, because you know the IVs and endogeneity problems were uh, big at that time, are still big. Um, they were basing all their papers on, ah, I found a good instrument and now I'm thinking about the question that goes around that. Um, uh, think about, uh, you know, one good idea for one paper is enough. Uh, and you really need to think how to kind of test that idea. But it's not about, oh, I found this model, which has a very you know, elaborated names and it's adding an extra layer of complexity. So I want to use it. <laughs> now let's work around that. It seems silly, but I actually have seen a lot of students that that's what they do. They care more about finding the latest, uh, very difficult model to understand, you know, and, and point on the technicalities rather than on the in novelty of the idea. And then maybe the, the innovation is just very incremental rather than being something really new. 
Well, so we have a question here. We have two questions from the audience before we move to the closing ceremony. So um, one from Janet Kol Kolhas. Uh, what, what would be your ideal data set to study migration? And one from Mohamed El Faiz. What's the place of Maghreb migration in your studies? If there is one for them. It's in the uh, Q I already. <laughs> Okay. I, I already can start from the second one because I, I haven't thought about Maghreb migration in my studies, so I maybe we can talk about that, Mohamed, but at the moment, uh, uh, I don't think there's a place in my studies for this because I've never thought about that, to be honest. Um, okay, and uh, Janet, okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, what would be my ideal? Okay, so... One thing that I always find very difficult when I look at uh, migration uh, studies is having very fine details on the location of individuals. So I always have to proxy uh, where they move from and to with kind of larger uh, regions. Uh, I would like to have more detailed information on the location for sure. My ideal data migration would be probably uh, primary data, you know, having a lot of money and a lot of time to go and ask them rather than having to rely on secondary data. Uh, but for sure, uh, this idea of having very fine detail on location and possibly also some data that are comparable across countries, because in Europe, especially when you are trying to do cross country comparison, you end up having to use very large regions, which in the case of migration really don't tell you very much. Uh, one last question from yes. it's an anonymous young scholar, I think, because as a brave PhD, I usually send emails to various <laughs> authors, not all answer. What are the chances that you might answer if someone such as myself would have specific questions regarding a paper? That's a good one. Yeah, so uh, I'll be completely honest as the student yeah. is honest to me. The, the fact is that we're really struggling with the amount of emails that come in. So if I take two hours off and I don't read the email for one morning, I end up with sometimes 50 emails. And so it's very difficult to sieve through the emails. And sometimes what you do just as a survival uh, tool is to look at the ones that you know are attached to a deadline or the ones that come from your rector because he's telling you you need to do something and it's absolutely a necessity. So it's not a bad uh, will in a sense, but it's more absolutely complete lack of time that struck, uh, I guess, uh, most of, uh, of the senior people mm -hmm. uh, like us. So uh, it depends in which period you get me. So if you send me an email in a period uh, where basically I'm not very uh, busy and there are periods, uh, now I'm going to tell everybody, so I'll have 52 emails, uh, but like July or during the summer or uh, maybe September, uh, 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 or a, a week in which I don't have anything to do, I'll probably answer immediately. As my female uh, migrants, I'm very dichotomous. Either I answer immediately, or if I wait, they just go down uh, mm -hmm. to the second page and then never answer back. Having said that, you know, uh, maybe the second time I answer, if I get a reminder or whatever. Um, but it really depends. It's a little mm -hmm. bit of luck also for PhD students on how busy you get the person you write an email to, but it's not bad will. That's why it's important for us to get together in conferences, in academic meetings, so you get to know these, the senior scholars and probably when you send us an email, you're going to give, a, give a, another level of attention because you, get, you know the person. So that's, uh, uh, that's why I, I look forward to meeting you all in presence in future Regional Science Association international meetings of, from all our supranational associations. You have the uh, uh, wide range of meetings in the next uh, year or the next year. So you're all welcome to join us. I have to close this plenary session. I thank Alessandra, I thank Daniela for this very uh, interesting session, all the work and effort you put to deliver such a, a nice 
uh, keynote, uh, uh, Alessandra, and also Daniela, who made a, an excellent job discussing the, the talk. So thank you very much. Uh, we are moving directly to the closing ceremony. We wait for a couple of minutes to, 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 to change the, 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 the screen, right? Your Andrea is already here. Daniela, Alessandra, I invite you to join us. We are not going to take the whole 75 minutes for this session. We'll finish maybe in less than 30 minutes and we'll resume in like in one minute whenever everybody's here. Well, welcome, Peter, Andrea. Andrea, Hi. are you missing Hi. anyone? Yes, no, or... no, I'm here. Okay, so, yeah. So I think we can uh, uh, start the closing ceremony. Okay, Abdel, we are waiting for Abdel. Is he just missing? Can you check where? Any okay? What's well, so, uh, up, Andre? Could you? Uh, I'll start. Could you let Abdel know that you? I did. I texted. Him. Okay, so uh, he'll be joining. I'll, I'll talk for about ten minutes. Okay, so. We'll start. So let me. Okay. So let's start. Uh, dear members of the regional science community, dear friends and colleagues, after a very productive week when we had the opportunity to get together virtually, it's now time to say farewell. It's time for the closing ceremony of the 2021 Regional Science Association International World Congress. Organized by the Moroccan section, the World Congress fulfilled its role as a significant international forum for researchers and policymakers in regional science across the world. This edition of the event brought together more than 500 participants from 53 different countries. The papers covered all major areas of the field, with applications for a wide range of regions globally. I'm particularly pleased with the high participation of young scholars from the Global South. Since we have decided that the Congress would run 100% online, many colleagues from the association have joined us in an extraordinary effort to organize a high standard inclusive online event. Once again, I take this opportunity to extend my sincere gratitude and appreciation for the hard work and dedication provided by all of them. Special thanks go to former president Mark Partridge, who initiated this adventure, and Adelatif Hatabi, Andrea Caraglio, and Elizabeth Martins, who made it happen. I also would like to thank the IT team, led by our NARS colleague, John Sporing, who has provided a very professional service. As I have said in the opening ceremony, going online has shown to bring us some opportunities. Counting on the leadership's invaluable help across our four supranational associations, we have reached out every single national section and invited them to propose special sessions dedicated to their countries and regions. We have received positive response from almost all sections. This is really invigorating and motivating, further developing the sense of community belongingness that may motivate many young regional scientists to engage more broadly in the association. We had the opportunity to host a truly global Congress with many RSI sections participation. Going online also made possible wider participation across the world, allowing us to minimize the number of competing sessions, allocate time slots with time zones in mind, 
and reduce drastically registration fees. We started our days in Asia and Oceania, passing through Africa and Europe until reaching the Americas. The program's structure allowed members from every single part of the globe to take part in our gathering. A floating audience of around 150 to 100 participants was constantly jumping in and off sessions. The World Congress was a unique opportunity to showcase some of the exceptional work regional, science, uh, regional scientists are doing worldwide. In the last days, we had the opportunity to experience an enlightening picture of our association, being exposed to different topics and approaches people are using across the world. We also had the opportunity to welcome and meet, and meet different groups of regional scientists located in countries where no national section of the association is present. Supported by donations from Jeffrey Hewins and FIPI, a Brazilian think tank, we organized special sessions and invited scholars from such, such countries as, as Angola, Egypt, Lebanon, and Paraguay. Altogether, there were 136 parallel sessions, 39 of which dedicated to 25 national sections, in addition to five plenary sessions with outstanding keynote speakers. This edition of the World Congress was also a digital agora for exchanging ideas, a virtual place of strong networking. The network maps you can find on the first page of the program summarize the intensity of co-participation for authors presenting papers in the different sessions, suggesting a high propensity to exchange ideas among regional scientists worldwide. As envisioned by my, by my dear friend, Andrea Caraglio, our executive director, this Congress was supposed to be an opportunity for all of us to open new notes and further, further diffuse our discipline. Andrea, I have to say your efforts have paid off. From an institutional perspective, this network maps review opportunities for laying down solid foundations for reside future developments in strategic regions where the association is still not present and promoting and consolidating our presences or presence in countries and regions where sections already exist. From a personal perspective, my involvement, my involvement with the Regional Science Association International since 1995 in its various realms has created in me a deep sense of gratitude and belongingness. This identity has profoundly shaped my professional career so far in a way that strongly motivated me to serve the association at another level. According to our constitution, the, president, the presidency is not a ceremonial position and the president shall provide active and aggressive leadership in the areas of programs and policy development. In my understanding, such leadership benefits largely from the good government, government, governance of RISAI, which is inextricably linked to an active and a harmonious teamwork involving the council, the officers, and the long range planning committee. The president should have an active role in promoting and expanding regional science worldwide with a strong commitment to the, advance of, to the advances of our different fields of studies. In this sense, Professor Isabel Thomas' keynote lecture yesterday was very inspiring. One of the association's main aims is to promote the growing in knowledge and influence of regional science in the academic, political, and social world realms. Despite a successful story in the developed world, there is a long road ahead to embrace the developing world, which, which should consider the building and strengthening of networks among national, international, and multilateral institutions with the, active, with the active involvement of regional scientists from our association. From an institutional perspective, it's crucial to have a prominent role in leading and helping organizing reside in, a in strategic regions where the association is still not pre present, laying down solid foundations for its future developments. There are other challenges that the association faces, including how to create more sections in Africa and the Middle East and breathe even more life into Presco and Larsa. 
It's also important to follow up on current discussions to raise the awareness of women in regional science associations taking practical actions to reduce the gender bias. I recognize that the World Congress is a significant event with specific aims different from the Congresses promoted by the supranational associations. Hence, it plays a crucial role in establishing a bridge between the four supranational associations being a vehicle to enlarge regional science. In the recent past, RISI has developed a set of successful programs that need to be continuously pushed forward and if needed, improved in their designs and implementation. It will be important to induce demand in all supranationals through effective dissemination and communication of current opportunities. I cite here the triplet formed by the Nurturing Talent, Thinking Big and Building Bridges. They all provide opportunities for developing the presence of the association across the space in terms of geography and time involving the young generations. Moreover, I consider the approval of the reduction of membership fees for sections based in the developing world to be a strategic movement that the association may, fur may further capitalize in its continuing geographical expansion. A final point that I consider deemed important is the need for reside members to recognize themselves as true members. The association offers many advantages that go beyond access to our journals and reduced fees in Congresses. I would like to emphasize something I have just said. Increasing members' awareness will help further developing the sense of community belongingness that may motivate an increasing number of young regional science scientists to engage more broadly in the association. I would like to conclude by thanking our sponsors and partners. We, we received a generous donation from FIPI and RUS, both institutions from Brazil. The Policy Center for the New South, a Moroccan think tank, generously provided all registered participant courtesy copies of the volume, The COVID-19 Crisis, Viewed from the South. The Policy Center also committed to organize two in-presence regional science events in Morocco, very likely in 2022 <clears throat> and 23, after no normal travel resumes. For those of you who wanted to go to Morocco, there will be two forthcoming opportunities very soon. John, John Wiley and Sons kindly made access to of specific issues of papers in regional science and regional science policy and practice free, free to all participants. I also would like to mention the Regional Science Academy our four local academic institu uh, institutions, Université Mohamed VI Polytechnique, Université Mohamed V de Rabat, CAD, CADI Ayad University, and the École Nationale d'Architecture. And finally, our four supranational sections, NARSC, URSA, PRESCO, and LARSA. Their participation and commitment to the Regional Science Association International are crucial and truly appreciated. Thus, on behalf of the Regional Science Association International, the local organizing committee and the scientific committee, I would like to thank you all once again for joining us at this historical meeting and for sharing your experience, research and views with all the participants. Please receive my very best wishes and I look forward to meeting you all in presence in the forthcoming events of the association. Now, I would like to invite uh, Abdel Hatif. Is he here? Yes. I'd like to invite Abdel, Abdel Latif Hatabi, chair of the local organizing committee and president of the Morocco Regional Science Association for his closing remarks. Abdel. Of at the end of the 13th World Congress of RSI. Today, the Morocco Regional Science Association, we are very pleased and very proud to have taken up a challenge that seemed four years ago, just to talk. Indeed, the idea of organizing the International Congress of RSI for us as young association, seven years only, all, as I already mentioned in my 
pro Marx during the opening session was just a dream. We would have very difficult to make it happen. The idea of organizing this Congress by the Moroccan Regional Science Association was born from an early discussion with colleagues from RSI four years ago. These colleagues continue to support the idea until it become the reality you are witnessing today. The efforts done and the help provided by many colleagues, but mainly by three persons, most of you all know, were very instrumental on the creation of the Moroccan section and also the suggestion and preparation for the organization of this Congress and other scientific events. Allow me to name them and thank them very much for their unconditional help and assistance. They are professors Peter Nijkamp, Dom Thomas Lentino, and Karim Akurtit. At the beginning, I was not personally very enthusiastic for organizing the Congress. Now in the great effort and effective involvement and time that it would require, and also the potential risk of failure or limited level of success that it could have. But thanks to the insistence, assistance and encouragement of these colleagues, we took the initiative to apply for the organization of this Congress without having much hope of the acceptance of our candidacy. To our great pleasure and surprise, our application was unanimously accepted by the Council of RSI without any reserve. One year later, we have started seriously and with a lot of motivation the preparation of the Congress when Mark Partridge and Andrea Caraglio came into board, respectively as RSI president and director. Because of the restrictions imposed by the World Health Conditions, this Congress, which was planned to be organized in Marrakesh at this time, at the same time last year, was postponed for one year, hoping to have open skies and freedom of gathering in 2021. Unfortunately, the constraints imposed by the pandemic didn't improve and we ended up organizing the Congress virtually. What you have experienced during this Congress was achieved thanks to the technical assistance of NARSC colleagues, to the bright and innovative ideas of both Eduardo Haddad and Andrea Caraglio, and the studious and meticulous work of Mrs. Elizabeth Martins. All of them, I take this opportunity to congratulate for the success of the event and thank them for their continuous commitment and the effort provided. The Congress success is a result of collaborative work to which many persons and institutions, already cited by Eduardo Haddad in his remarks, have contributed either by their scientific, technical, or financial support. Without the Congress success, to the distinguished quality of the participants, specialists in different disciplines of regional science, who have helped to fuel rich and innovative debate, and also to person in charge of the organization who had to make informed decisions about the tasks and activities for which they were responsible. I will not, of course, attempt to draw up an assessment of the reflections that have been developed and the achievements that have been reached during the five years. Congress days, but if you allow me, I will try to express my feelings of what has happened. As you might have noticed, there is no doubt that this Congress was a great platform of scientific exchange due to the relevance and the quality of the topics addressed. Indeed, we had the chance to listen to high quality presentations given by eminent scientists and experts coming from different regions of the world who shared with us their knowledge through inspiring key speeches or scientific approaches and results. The communication and the debates that have followed one another during these five days have perfectly fulfilled the objectives that the organizers have set themselves. I have been struck, as I think you all have been, by the richness and the variety of the interventions supported by the most demanding research in regional science. The topic that have been discussed are varied and rich and deal with current interests, which are the major concern of regional science disciplines in different countries. In addition to the intensive information, the experiences ex exchanged during the Congress sessions, the interactive relationships that have been established during the Congress, some I have witnessed myself and others I have heard about, are promising and encouraging for potential and future concrete scientific partnerships and cooperations. In this regard, and in accordance with the wish of our present our president on promoting regional science in places where it's not very much represented, I would like to extend an invitation in full agreement with my colleagues from the Moroccan section 
to any person or RSI section who would like to collaborate with us in joint initiatives to organize other scientific or outreach events. We will be very happy to cooperate in promoting regional science, especially within Africa and the Middle East. Before concluding my remarks, I would like to reiterate my gratitude and thanks to all the key speakers, professors Tofik Moulin, Edouard Glazer, Sikitsan, Isabel Thomas, and Alessandra Fergian for their inspiring talk. All the guests who joined us, despite the time zones differences, to kindly share their experiences and expertises. To all the organizers of this event, including the scientific committee, the international organizing committee, the local organizing committee, NARSC, and all other supranationals, the international and local institutions who partnered with us or supported us. The Regional Science Academy was organized two main events during the Congress and who has supported us continuously and regularly since the beginning of this venture. With this, I come to the end of my remarks and I hope to see you or meet you again sometimes somewhere in the near future. God bless you. Thank you very much, Adele, for this very uh, inspiring talk and it really was really uh, very nice. So before, before I, I give the word to Andrea Caraglio for his closing remarks and for officially closing the World Congress, we are going to um, have the announcement of two of our prizes, the uh, Regional Science Association International Young Researchers Prize and the 2020 Regional Science Association International Best Dissertation Award. I, I would like to ask our colleagues from the, uh, from that are the, you, from IT to, to invite the three awardees of the, uh, they already know, but before I announce the uh, best dissertation award, award, I would like to invite Professor Peter Nyka, member of the jury for the 2021 Rizai Young Researchers Prize to announce the two winners. Thank you, Peter, for all your contributions throughout the decades and specifically for the success of this World Congress. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo. I have the, uh, the pleasant task to read now for you the concise uh, jury report on the 2021 Young Researchers Prize. The jury had five members, Tetsiana Sabadini, Karima Kurtit, Martin Anderson, Abdel Katabi, and myself. A few words on the prize. The RSI Young Researchers Prize aims to showcase high quality research of young scholars. So it's not for people like Eduardo or me, it is for really young, promising uh, scholars, based on a paper which has been presented at the World uh, Conference. So a jury is the members which I just uh, mentioned. They have uh, carefully evaluated several candidate papers uh, looking into the quality, the originality, and many other indicators which uh, are uh, normally uh, handled in awarding a prize. And I have to tell you, that was really a great pleasure. And sometimes I feel bored when I have to review a paper, which I have to do many times, uh, sometimes a week, but to review a paper of a young uh, scientist with the intention that he or she might get an award is a totally different thing and much more pleasant than reviewing a normal paper for a journal. So uh, on behalf of the jury, I'm uh, very pleased to announce the 2021 World Conference Prize winners for the young generation. The first prize goes to Karina Acosta for her paper, Small Area Estimation of Multidimensional Poverty, the case of Cambodia. There she is. We had never met before, Karina, 
but it's really nice to see you and uh, it's i'm really impressed and the jury was impressed by the quality of your work your paper uh, contained a well-crafted and also statistically advanced study of multidimensional poverty and measuring of poverty in cambodia at a granulated detailed uh, spatial scale using uh, statistical techniques like small area estimation methods in the framework of uh, Bayesian spatial hierarchical uh, modeling, done in a very sophisticated way. And you introduced also and advocated new ways of measuring uh, poverty, uh, different indicators, and at a very refined spatial scale. And that has really led to quite some, uh, quite some innovative uh, output. So your approach is uh, advanced and also it deserves to be followed elsewhere. It can also be uh, applied in other cases and we would hope that your paper would also set a role model also for future research on uh, poverty at a uh, regional and local scale. So the jury was impressed by the design and statistical quality of your analysis based also on a rich uh, data set. So congratulations and compliments. Thank you so much. I'm very pleased to be here and to be awarded this prize. I was not expecting it actually, um, but um, yeah, I felt like regional science uh, has given me that opportunity to involve many sciences, which what is regional science is about. And this is part as part of my dissertation, I was, I was able to exactly do this interaction of multiple disciplines and coming out with this outcome, which I, as you mentioned, I hope it will be uh, hopeful for future research and also indicators um, that are going to be, are, I'm hoping to be developed for many developing countries at the special, a small spatial scale. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really pleased to be here again. Thanks. We hope to see you many times at our meetings. Uh, okay, good, thank you. Well, we have a second prize winner. The second prize winner is John Emmanuel Villanova. Uh, he is also with us, I think. Yeah, there he is. Again, we had never met, but science will cross all borders, and I'm excessively pleased also to see you. And um, John Emmanuel has done um, an interesting study, a very interesting original study on uh, what was called political dynasties and human development investments, evidence of linkage from Rizal province in the Philippines. And this is a very unconventional study on local dynasties with the aim to explore the impact of dynastic municipal governments on human development investments. So it is a study at the interface of regional economics, political economics, administrative science, historical uh, economic analysis and so on. And that is something which is uh, often missing in our work. And the jury very much appreciated your broad perspective, also on the historical past dependent component of dynasties on human development investments in uh, regions in the, in the Philippines. So you performed a multivariate panel regression analysis on various uh, municipalities and you introduce the concept of the FET dynastic mayors, uh, mayors who are well anchored in, let's say, local dynasties. And it turned out that especially FET dynastic mayors in uh, local municipalities, they have significantly lower human development investments compared to their non-dynastic uh, counterparts. So this has led to very interesting uh, economic, socio-economic, and even political uh, conclusions. And as said before, the jury very much appreciates your unconventional research topic and the data analytics. Of course, uh, you had to face a poor data situation. So that limits, of course, the statistical uh, and econometric sophistication of your work. But nevertheless, you've done a great job also with your panel regression and model. So this second prize is meant to be an encouragement prize also for uh, doing further solid research work. And we, we hope to, to hear much more from you also in the future at 
our meeting. So please come back with more of these types of papers that is badly needed. So compliments and uh, congratulations. Thank you very much, sir. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. First, uh, I'd like to congratulate Karina Acosta. Uh, I read her abstract. I think it's really amazing. So she deserves the first prize. But uh, as for getting the second prize, it's also an amazing feeling for me because I'm uh, I'm a new uh, researcher. I'm, I'm only, I only have a master's degree. Uh, so I'm still a budding uh, researcher. I may, may uh, undergraduate degrees in economics, but I, no, I'm now focusing in terms of public policy. So uh, yeah, I'm inspired with the, the, the articles of uh, Sam McGlue and Robinson that, you know, uh, it's really actually about politics. Economics will, will go after politics. So uh, political dynasties dictate so much about the, the Philippine politics and also the economics in the Philippines. So it's really important to look at the effects of their uh, dominance in terms of political power into the uh, human development of their constituents in the Philippines. So again, and also I'd like to thank the RSI for uh, the Building Bridges program because uh, I wouldn't be able to uh, participate here uh, if not for the uh, waiver of the fee. So I'm really grateful for your uh, support to uh, researchers like me from the Global South. So again, thank you very much. Well, that was, uh, that was a great uh, pleasure. If Eduard allows me maybe one more minute and then I will absolutely stop. Uh, but I just would like to also say a, a few personal words of thanks to, uh, to all of you. Um, what a great event. It has been an unforgettable week with highlights in regional science. And uh, when we started to think about having a world conference in Morocco together with uh, Abdel and, and Karima and Mark and, uh, and Andrea and many others, okay, we had to solve many issues, but uh, there was the, the deep belief and conviction, we will make it. And indeed, uh, we made it under different circumstances compared to what we had, of course, originally anticipated. But the good thing is in Morocco, people are able to improvise and at the end, uh, they have been able to organize a splendid uh, conference. I'm really proud of the organizational talents in Morocco, Abdel and also his staff, because that was absolutely amazing. I also would like to thank, of course, um, um, Eduardo for his great leadership in bringing this together, uh, inspiring all of us. That is absolutely fantastic. Andrea has played an enormous role. He has uh, well shown um, unbelievable organizational talents in an intellectual setting. So uh, really, uh, we are very happy with you, uh, uh, Andrea, and of course, Elisabetta and others behind the scene and behind the curtains, they have played, it, of course, in a very important role because we sometimes only see the, the major people, but there are many others behind the scene and they ought to be thanked as well because without them, we could even not, not uh, perform. So all in all, I had a great week. Our um, Regional Science Association International Family had a great week. And uh, like in all good families, we want more. And uh, so Morocco was a role model for many others. And I hope that we will all meet again very soon. And uh, until then, uh, be well. Thank you, Peter, for these very kind words. And I really appreciate, you know, they are, they are very important for us coming from uh, someone like you, it's really very motivating. Thank you very much. Um, before uh, 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 Andrea delivers his um, closing speech, I would like to announce the second uh, award winner, right? Daria Denti, she's here is the recipient of the 2020 Regional Science Association International Best Dissertation Award. Her, her thesis entitled Essays on the Economic Geography of Oppressive Violent Deviant Behaviors was supervised by Professor Alessandra Pajan, who is also here, if you can appear to us, Alessandra. Uh, and also Professor Simona Yamarino, is she, she's not here, from the London School of Economics and Political Sciences. Daria's dissertation examines, examines the geography of oppressive, violent, deviant behavior 
including hate crimes, gender-based violence, and school violence. The committee found her dissertation to be novel, timely, methodologically sound, compelling, and impactful. Her dissertation is truly path-breaking in regional science, highlighting the importance of space in driving resentful, violent acts and the role of policy in this regard. Daria, congratulations for you, for Alessandra, and for Simona, Simona, Simona for this excellent uh, work. So thank you very much. I mean, it's more than a honor. And I mean, yeah, I would like to thank you, the dissertation committee, because I think, I mean, it has been a huge job to go through all the dissertation. And I mean, even if it's virtual, I also would like to thank all the people that have been attending all the conferences in which I participate, because it was also through that that I improved my work to the point that you, know, you gave me the award. And of course, I mean, she was talking before, I want to thank Alessandra and of course Simona, because they were not only my supervisors, they engaged in my paper, but the thing is that, I mean, uh, yeah, the topic were kind of path breaking. And I mean, my true supervisor, they were supporting me since the very beginning. I mean, they were believing in my idea. So I think this is the beauty of the discipline, finding professor that can like support and open new path. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And I, I'd like to reinforce uh, Peter's invitation. You, you've been to different uh, conference, but also for Karina, John Emmanuel to join us in future uh, uh, academic meetings. You're more than welcome. And please uh, consider being part of our family. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, without further ado, I will now give the word to Andrea Caraglio for his concluding remarks and for the official closing of our World Congress. Andrea, the screen is yours. Thank you, Eduardo and everyone. I'll make a long story short because we are all exhausted, I am confident. Um, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends of the Regional Science Association International, it is a bit sad, but frankly relieving to say goodbye to the 13th World Congress of the Regional Science Association. Sad because the event has been all in all successful, bringing together more than 500 paper presentations organized in 134 sessions, including regular, special, and national sessions from authors hailing from 53 countries and all five continents. We did not cover Antarctica so far, unfortunately. Two regional science academy sessions, five outstanding keynote speakers, and many chances to present our own work and listen, listen to what is being done at the frontier of research in regional science. I've personally heard people mumbling in front of the screen or chatting in Spanish, Korean, French, Italian, Chinese, and Greek, beyond English, of course, which was the working language of the Congress. The quality of the presentation was also excellent, and I personally learned a lot and got a couple of ideas myself for future research. It's also relieving as a week in front of a screen is very tough. We had our share of technical issues solved with the excellent support of John Sporing, Caleb Stair, and all the staff behind the names of the virtual rooms that you had on the screen. We've also received suggestions to further improve the ease of the interaction via the e platform, which we take on board as advice to make this experience even better if possible. Although frankly, we are all eager, I guess, to get back to normality and meet again in presence soon. Personally, I was, for instance, fantasizing about ending this speech today, getting a cab to Marrakesh's Medina, buy a gift for the family in the Souk Marrakesh, sip a mint tea and watch the sunset of the, on the mosques of the Jema El Fna, the central market in the city. If you've never been there, please do. Then go back to bed, collapse, ready for the flight back home tomorrow morning. I would like to thank the countless people making this happen, the RSI Council and the Long Range Planning Committee members who strived to fine tune the Congress and leveraged on their networks to attract quality papers to the Congress. The immediate past president, Mark Partridge, with whom the decision to hold the Congress in Marrakesh was made 
and the organization of the Congress started, but sadly, of course, had to be postponed as we were struck in the midst of the worst pandemic uh, in the past century. Eduardo Haddad, the, the present president of the Regional Science Association International, with whom the organization of the online Congress went as smooth as silk, with many outstanding and innovative proposals which shaped the Congress the way it eventually uh, was. Abdel Latif Katabi and the local organizing committee who showed us around in Marrakesh, Esawira, even joined URSA in 2019 only with the goal of fine tuning our beloved creature, if you allow me the wording. And most importantly, the participants who stood hours in front of a screen fighting against remote working problems. I personally saw, I don't know if this happened to you, but I saw cats and babies pop up in front of the screen every now and then, which of course makes it even harder. Uh, some withstood diseases, some or actually many uh, withstood connection problems and even typhoons, people connecting from India and Bangladesh to present their own work. As I used to write on my own papers, all remaining errors are our own. Goodbye, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Okay, so that was it. I hope you all have uh, enjoyed the last week. And the, I officially close now our 2021 World Congress. Hope to see you soon in presence. Keep safe and have a good one. Goodbye, thank you all. Goodbye, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, John.